welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And this is Mark Florence. And today we're talking about Fatal Attraction. This movie from 1987, it's a classic. How have we never seen this movie? I have no idea. I've just, I've heard of it. Um, I guess it's not like popular amongst people our ages, maybe? Yeah, I think it was popular when it came out, but like we don't necessarily seek it out to see. And wow, it was actually amazing. So it came out in 1987. It has a 77% on Rotten Tomatoes. Budget of fourteen million, three hundred twenty million at the box office. That's a lot. That is a lot. Um, that's impressive for that day and age, and didn't seem like it had that big of a budget. So, whoever made that did pretty well for themselves. This isn't a traditional horror movie, but I think it's absolutely horrific. Yeah, it's more in the thriller category, I guess you could say, but. To me, the most, like, sus- suspenseful or horrifying thing about the movie was how unpredictable Glenn Close, whose name was Alex, was. I mean, she you never knew what she was capable of, and it's she pretty much is capable of just about anything, so that was pretty scary. Yeah, like, Michael Douglas just figures, you know, oh, he's at this book launch, and he's there with his hot to trot wife like she's a straight up hottie but glenn close flirts with him and guess what they get it on as soon as his wife is out of town yeah, they turn out that they work together so he sees her there and then he leaves and you kind of leave it at that but then he sees her at a work meeting and then it's raining outside, and he's trying to get a cab, and he can't get his umbrella open. And it seems pretty, you know, fairly innocent, but they're kind of flirting and stuff. And it's like, oh, you want to go get a drink, be you know, while it's raining or whatever. And then one thing leads to another. His wife and kid are out of town, and uh, they just go have a rendezvous. Yikes! Okay, so first of all, at this book launch where they meet each other. There's some racism because there's this book launch for this um, Japanese author and it's all a, a little bit racist. But, you know, I guess it's 1987, so we have to dismiss that. Um, the I Heart New York symbol is on some bags and you're like, are they a sponsor? And I'm like, I don't know. But I Heart New York, so I love it. Yeah, it was on the on the bag and i think it was on like his coffee cup or it was on a few other things so i think it was just that was pretty popular back then and the movie did take place in uh, new york city so it made sense there's the one employee or co-worker the guy with the neck brace have you ever been in contact with someone who had to wear a neck brace <laughs> i can't recall I think I've seen people in public wearing them, but I've, I guess I've never had interactions with somebody with a neck brace. I haven't either, so that's why I'm wondering if they're real. I take that back. I used to work with a lady who um, who would sometimes sport a neck brace, and then she had a surgery on her neck, and then she had to wear a neck brace. She ended up retiring because of various back and uh, neck issues. Well, my goodness. Okay, I take it all back. I guess they're real. <laughs> yes, they're very real. <laughs> okay, they have... Somebody has a dog. Can you imagine having to walk a dog in New York City? Like, having to walk a dog anywhere. I realize people have to do it in regardless of where. But we've been spoiled because we've lived in the country and we've lived in a house with a fenced-in yard. We've never had to actually walk a dog. I take it for granted. I mean, we bring our dogs, our dog on walks still, but we don't have to walk him like multiple times a day so we can go to the bathroom and then we don't have to like follow after him with a bag and clean up after him. So I'm pretty thankful for that. Yeah. Like, I mean, we take it for granted. This one thing about the, the sex scene, the first sex scene with uh, Michael Douglas, whose name is Dan and Glenn Close, 
Uh, there is some nudity, and I uh, I never planned in my life on seeing Glenn Close naked, <laughs> but I but I but I did it. It happened, and what we were saying is, I mean, we recognize Glenn Close from more of her recent filmography, and so to see her as this sex pot who's having this affair with Michael Douglas. It seemed out of character for her, but, like, guess what? She sells it because she's an amazing actress. I think she has a perm. I don't know if she did, but guess what? A lot of us had perms in the 80s. There was a lot of big, big hair in this movie. Um, Both Glenn Close and uh, his wife, Beth, had the big, curly, like, uh, 80s hair. Yeah, I mean, I had that hair, so, I mean, I get it. And also, they, when they were having their rendezvous in the restaurant, they were just, like, openly smoking. And I know it wasn't that long ago, because it was in the 2000s, but people smoking in restaurants? Like, what the heck? Yeah, it seems so foreign now that that was a thing, but that definitely was a thing. And I remember being in many bars where there was just filled with smoke so it just seems weird now i remember the first concert we ever went to do you remember it was snoop dogg and there was just a cloud of smoke and it wasn't cigarette smoke it was definitely something else yeah in my opinion it's okay to smoke weed wherever you want so (laughs) (laughs) cigarettes are bad though so glenn close i i think she's playing at her apartment or his apartment or something, Madame Butterfly. And it's this opera. And I know Miss Saigon, which I really loved, just like, you know, not yet a decade after this movie premiered. I loved that musical, which was based on that and took place during the Vietnam War. I realize now it's all problematic, but, you know... It's it's interesting that it was like a plot point in this movie. I think they talked about the the opera that they were listening to and like the plot and was I can't remember what the plot was, but that, was that some kind of foreshadowing for what was going to happen in the movie or I can't remember. Yeah, absolutely it was. Do you remember what they were what they said or Well, so I know during Miss Saigon, he sleeps with a woman and has a child with her and then He has to reconcile it with his wife. And so Glenn Close was claiming she was pregnant. Did we ever know if she was actually pregnant? It was never confirmed. And, I mean, she was so manipulative that you you never could believe anything she would do or say. But he did break into her apartment at one point, and I think he found, like, a pregnancy test, and he found, I don't know, some article about her dad who had died or something, but... I don't think it was ever actually confirmed. So this movie, um, I was looking it up, and it's talking about how she is a person with borderline personality disorder. And one of the most famous examples of that on film is the movie Girl Interrupted. Did you ever see that with Angelina Jolie? And I think it's Winona Ryder. Man, I think I did, but I do not recall any of it. So that's, you know, that example of that disorder. Of course, everything that is on film is, you know, absolutely heightened for drama. So, you know, it's not necessarily realistic. But um, I know a lot of psychologists had a lot to say about Glenn Close's character after this movie came out. Yeah, I mean, unless you would have said that, I would, I would, you know, you just assume like, oh, she's nuts, she's crazy. But it's kind of interesting that there actually is supposedly like a diagnosis or a, a illness behind how, why she's acting that way. Yeah, I mean, I believe in medication, people. So get medicated if you need to. There's no harm in that. This was probably possibly before that. You know, that was more, you know, acceptable or prevalent to get medicated. So I have a feeling she was not medicated. No, I don't think so either. 
this daughter that Michael Douglas has keeps getting manipulated. I feel so sorry for her. And like this little actress, she's supposedly six, which our daughter is six right now. And I feel so sorry for her, little Ellen, like all the trauma she has to go through. And the actress, P.S., besides the character, like, how did they make her cry? What did they tell her to make her cry on film? Poor child. The the scene where they killed the bunny was, uh, or when Alex killed the bunny was uh, pretty traumatic. Because, right, I mean... The, there was a they got home from somewhere like being gone for a long time and there was a pot boiling at their house and like it was like in perfect unison the daughter goes out to check on the rabbit right when the mom opened up the the pot to see the dead rabbit boiling in there so that was pretty pretty uh troubling scene speaking of editing this this entire sequence with the daughter missing and Glenn Close has picked her up from school and then the mother searching for her. It was so well done and it was, it, I mean, it made me feel panic because can you imagine if you went to pick up our daughter from school and they're like, oh no, she was already picked up and she's not home. Like what in the world? And Thankfully, Glenn Close literally drops her off and she's like, give me a kiss on the cheek. And it was fine. But how messed up is this? Extremely messed up. I would have been just, I don't, don't even know what to do, obviously. They call the cops even? I can't remember. But yeah, I mean, especially back then, you had very little like avenues to go. I mean, honestly, today that would have been one of those like Amber Alert situations probably. Um, but yeah. And then the, the chaotic, um, I don't know what the right word is like comparison of them on a roller coaster and the mom driving around chaotically looking for the kid. And then like, as they're going down the, to the top and then going down the roller coaster, the mom like rear ends some car. So just, just a pretty crazy scene. Yeah, the juxtaposition of the literal roller coaster and this mother going through the roller coaster of emotions and rear-ending a car. The daughter gets returned. Michael Douglas literally meets them at the hospital and sees his wife, you know, beat up from this car accident because she's searching for the daughter. It's insane. It's incredible. And the the real life situation, I know I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but the Jacob Wetterling kidnapping was prevalent in our childhoods. And a couple of years ago, I, when it was you know revealed that his body was found and the, the guy who murdered him confessed, I saw his mother speak at an event. And I cannot tell you what an effect that had on me because she was, I mean, she still is such a proponent of missing children, finding mil- missing children. I, I assume, like, I don't know what would happen because it's an unknown, but I assume if one of my children went missing, I would curl up into a shell and be incoherent. Yet she is this amazing force in the world and that whole in- entire family has done nothing but good for missing children and in memory of their son. Do you remember hearing about Jacob Wetterling when you were a kid? That was a huge story when I was a kid. I mean, that was like the example of, of uh, somebody being kidnapped randomly. And it happened near, you know, it happened in Minnesota, somewhat near where I grew up. So, I mean, that was a huge story. And I, I think I was roughly his same age, maybe. So, Yeah. I do. And yeah, it's too bad. I mean, it's good to get closure about what happened there, but um, that's unfortunate. Just crazy. And that reminds me of that movie based on the book, Lovely Bones, which was heartbreaking and just wow. Like, 
child disappearance kidnapping. I I can't even watch that Madeline McCain documentary because I don't think I can handle it. Yeah, I watched a few episodes of that, and that was that yeah, was pretty pretty disturbing too. And then they had to deal with you know being in a foreign country and you know the, how the police force worked in Portugal. I think they were in or somewhere in Spain. But anyway, back to uh, uh, Fatal Attraction here. I was kind of wondering, like, how old these actors were, because I think of them now as being old, you know, Michael Douglas and Glenn Close, but when they made the movie, Glenn Close was 40 and Michael Douglas was 43, and at one point in the movie, uh, Alex mentions that she's 36 years old, so that's my age. Yes, and so it's crazy because now that we know, like, these actors as older people like we just assume oh they're older than we are but in reality they're our age or younger which is okay like i guess i have to deal with this now it's mortality mark i hear you yeah now i'm like older than like almost every nfl football player so (laughs) yikes that's it's crazy it's crazy um but you know i feel young and i'm young at heart so that's 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 all that matters Totally, totally. So before they go out of town, they get back from the party, like Michael Douglas and his wife, and he thinks, you know, they're getting ready for bed, and he thinks that's when he has to go walk the dog, and then he thinks him and his wife are going to have this nice romantic time, and he comes back, and his six-year-old daughter's in bed with them. So I thought that was kind of familiar yeah no it's it's funny and it's realistic because guess what kids you you can think like oh this is how i'll i'll be as a parent or i would never let my child say that or do that but guess what it happens and things happen they end up sleeping in bed when you don't want them to or they end up saying something you don't want them to or they end up watching tv more than you want them to and it's reality Definitely, yeah. It's just part of being a parent. <laughs> I wrote down exercise bike that you wanted to expand on a little bit. Alex has an exercise bike in her apartment. Did you have an exercise bike growing up? I, we did, actually. My my mom had one in their bedroom. Yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those with a huge fan thing on the front. So, like, when you went, it was like... It's like a fan, so it could kind of cool you off. And there's different settings and all that. And um, it was set up in front of a TV, so that was, yeah, I, yeah. Or you could like just do it with your arms, or you could just do it with your legs, or you could just do it with both. So you know, I got a pretty pretty good workout. When I was little, like kindergarten, we had just a regular exercise bike, again set up in front of a TV. I used to watch Sesame Street and sit on that bike. I don't know that that I would necessarily exercise. But when I got older, we had that kind that where you move your arms and there's the fan. And I remember I was on Weight Watchers back then. And I'd be like, I need to exercise this long to burn this many calories so I can earn this many points so I can, you know, eat this or whatever. Exercise bikes were a part of my life for decades. I remember that bike at your parents, and I used to also ride that. So, hey, uh, maybe we should get one. No, no more. No more exercise bikes. We are healthy. We are active. Like, let's not do that to ourselves anymore. What about the Nordic track? Remember that? I do remember that. Wait, did my parents have one? Maybe. Did you? My grandma and grandpa had one. So whenever we went over there, we would do it. That's like the cross-country skiing one where it like mimics cross-country skiing. So yeah, we always enjoyed that at my grandparents' house. So my thing was like we lived in the country and we had 40 acres of ours plus I think 200 acres of family. You just rolled your eyes. Oh, okay. You're rolling eyes at the dog. Of cross-country ski trails. Did you ever cross-country ski on our trails? Or was that past your time? 
I think I did once or twice. Your dad uh, groomed the trails for me, and I did. So that was thanks, Bob. Cross country skiing, like it's good exercise. I know it's not as fast and furious as downhill, but I grew up with cross country, and we had this little tiny hill on that 40 acre trail, and it was like, okay, I'm not going to fall this time, you know? I do remember. We used to go to a cross country skiing resort in somewhere in Wisconsin, and yeah, it was always my brother and I was like, okay, we're going to go down the hill now. It's just this, like, not even a big hill, but like half the time we would wipe out. Because cross country skis aren't built for that, right? Exactly, yeah. They're basically built to stay in those two little tracks. And once you get off, once you get off of that, it's uh and going up hills is hard too. I I I take it back. I don't like cross country skiing. <laughs> I mean, it's good exercise, but yeah, it's it's difficult. Well, anyway, <laughs> back to fatal attraction from cross country skiing. I mean, after the very first I think they were together for like one night and then he wanted to, he was like kind of like sort of done with it. And then she kind of manipulated him to coming over to her house for like another night. And even him just leaving that first time, she was seeming crazy. And then like, as he tried to leave, she like slid her wrists and it was just a freaking shocking scene. Yeah. Like absolutely. It was manipulative and needy and I realize she has a mental health issue but it was beyond okay and like maybe I'm jaded because I hear of people having like these one night stands or whatever but my goodness this is every person's worst nightmare like you think you're gonna hook up for a night and like whatever it's it's a one-off but instead, oh, well, guess what? I have to hang out because she tried to kill herself. Yeah, I mean, you just put yourself, not that you should feel bad for the guy in that situation, but I mean, that's just the, not the situation like you want to be in. Like, And I think he had to end up staying overnight again or something. And it was like, you know, Michael obviously wasn't, he just wanted to have fun for a night or two and it just got way way out of control really fast i think the only other michael douglas movie we've reviewed on horror rewind has been the game and because i can't think of any other horror-esque movie he's been in but he's a good actor like i i respect him yeah i enjoy i enjoy michael douglas uh films i can't <laughs> Can't think of too many offhand, I guess, but yeah, he's a he's a great actor, and he, I don't know, he's pretty serious, but he's you know very believable, and he's got a kind of a cool like corporate look to him. So, yeah. did you ever see Wall Street? Definitely, yeah, Gordon Gecko, yeah. So that was you know Gordon Gecko, and then he was in the game. So and then so after the, you know after that weekend, she kept calling the ho- the house, you know, and then she'd hang up if the uh his wife answered and we were just thinking pre pre caller id and pre uh star six was it star six nine yeah to so you can't do that anymore they yeah they literally didn't know who would be calling but guess what like later in the movie he called her she just sitting alone in her apartment the phone rings and she calls him out by name because guess what she probably doesn't have anyone else calling her literally yeah she's literally sitting on her bed doing absolutely nothing just with the phone next to her like i mean she was obviously like trying to do all this stuff just to manipulate the guy to call her back or whatever but i mean and then i turned to kelly at that point i'm like this lady has no life at all like this is like pathetic slash scary yes and that's why it's such a great movie and within the horror genre i think and then and then you know to make matters worse you know kind of 
they work together so they have to see each other sometimes or kind of work together sometimes so it's not like he can just have this you know one night stand or this weekend with some strange some stranger like they have to like interact and see each other and also i mean not like today i feel like if you have a cell phone and someone has your cell phone number like you can bro- block them and like they don't know where you live but she literally shows up at the place where they live the apartment saying like oh i'm gonna rent this place and he has to pretend like he doesn't know her or that they oh i don't remember meeting you at that party it's the stakes are higher than i think they could be nowadays because you could be more anonymous now like you could hook probably hook up more randomly although their entire getting together is through work so maybe not and i don't even know if he was like looking for that like that weekend it just kind of like happened so yeah i don't think he was like planning on it or looking for it um you know there's a scene where he's he's not really returning her calls or talking to her or anything and she shows up at his office wearing this leather big leather coat and i was like oh no what's gonna happen they go into his office and i thought she was gonna rip it off and she was gonna be naked but unfortunately nothing happened oh you're into glenn close <laughs> like you didn't think you were but you are <laughs> um well i mean i saw guilty <laughs> i'm guilty guilty uh, i saw the big leather coat and i was like i bet you a million bucks she's gonna rip this coat off and be naked and they're gonna have sex on his desk or something but he just told her you know this can't happen anymore and kind of just fizzled right there and i was, was a little sad about that yeah you know so okay so the the guilty thing is from um british office if you're not familiar but yeah this movie though as we were we were talking about earlier before we started recording it's a good movie because even though it's dated, it's older, like the premise and the plot are so solid that we're drawn in regardless of fashion or obviously there's no special effects, but all of that, like it stands on its own. Yeah. Cause it's a, you know, it's a relatable story, like w- whatever time period or whenever the movie was made. So and yeah, this to me it was all about him not wanting to be exposed, and because he seemed to have a nice life with his wife, and they were gonna move out into the suburbs and buy a house, and you know, her just um, unpredictability and her obsession with the guy, like to ruin all that, and like I don't know, it's just. You know, he he wanted to just get rid of this thing, and um, but it just she wouldn't let that happen. This daughter, little Ellen, she's so sweet and she's so believable. And like I said earlier, when they make children cry on film when they're this young, like how do they do it? Because these poor kids, like they're probably crying for real, and it breaks my heart. And And when he calls after they have this breakup, I'm probably skipping ahead in your notes, but he's just like, I love you and I miss you. And she's like, I miss you, daddy. Like, it's so sad and believable and heartbreaking. And I just feel for everybody. Yeah. The, you know, the kid was a good, you know, showed what, what the stakes were in the relationship. So yeah and the, she obviously a couple times used a kid to manipulate him and it's just the wrong way to go about it in my opinion it's it's absolutely nuts but that's why it's a good movie and then the kicker is that she's pregnant i don't know if we already talked about that or not but she's oh we did but yeah she's supposedly pregnant so i mean that even makes things worse and he's you know, not worse but more complicated and he's like you know i'll pay for the abortion and stuff and she's like no no i'm gonna have the kid and stuff so it's just like wow yeah i mean it it absolutely ups the stakes and how can you argue argue with that like 
My goodness. And you know he's a he's a lawyer, so he knows the law and everything. But he's getting pretty uh, desperate with this whole situation, so he ends up like breaking into her apartment, like we mentioned earlier, to look to look for stuff, just anything. And I mean, so it got him out of like he seemed like a decent guy, but he ended up doing some pretty rash things to try to try to end it with her then another you know somewhat funny scene was that she was just sitting on her bed i think waiting for him to call or she called him or something and she had haagen ice cream um doritos oreos and some kind of like alcohol she was just like hanging out on her bed so i thought that was funny <laughs> it's so cliche but guess what like you go girl like that sounds good to me yeah don't get me wrong those are all good things but it's just kind of a pathetic scene to just be like sitting by yourself alone eating all those things waiting for some dude to call you but and then he he ends up changing his phone number and so then she can't call him at home anymore. So she like tries to go to the operator to get the number. And the guy's like, I can't give you that number. And she's like, fuck you. And the guy's like, my place or yours. So I thought that was funny. I mean, how bold of that operator, but like, how could you trace it back to a specific operator back in the day? Have you ever called the operator? Like, have you talked to an operator lately? Not in the past, it's like 25 years probably, but I I believe I have spoken with an operator before, yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Like, do operators still exist? Like, maybe I should dial zero right now and find out what happens. There might be. I, I, uh, just with the internet and all the resources you have available to you now, I can't imagine that you would ever need an operator, but I don't know, maybe. We're going to research this and find out. So then, yeah, so then things keep escalating. And he, for, at first, I don't think he wanted, he said he wasn't going to get a bunny, right? But then there's a scene, he has a bunny in his hand, and he's walking up to his car, and I can't remember if they showed her do it. They didn't. But he gets up to his car, and there's, like, acid all over it, like, on the hood, and it's, like, eating away at his car. And I thought that was just extreme. It's very extreme. And so he, you know, claims that, oh, there was there was this electrical problem and that's what's going on and whatever. But this is probably the first sign that, you know what, maybe you need to come clean with everybody involved and the cops and get this woman, like, on someone's radar. Because there's a problem. Yeah, earlier in the movie, he kind of confided in his friend, co-worker guy, kind of about what was going on. It's kind of hush-hush, and then he asks some cop or somebody else what uh, he did the old, yeah, my friend or my client is going through this situation. And then he kind of explained his situation and got some advice there. But yeah, sooner or later, I mean, the stakes got so high and everything got so extreme that he finally had to come clean and he did come clean after the bunny incident and his wife didn't take it well at first but then he called that's when he called her and she was waiting on the bed and he said my wife wants to talk to you she said well you don't have the balls to tell her and then his wife comes over and says, if you ever fucking talk to my family again, I'm going to kill you. So that was pretty cool. After she kidnaps his daughter and then brings the daughter back, instead of, at, at this point, I think he should have contacted the police, but he doesn't. This is when he goes back over to her apartment and basically... Waits for somebody to leave, goes up to her thing, buzzes the door, and the second she answers it, he like rushes the door, and that was probably one of the most intense scenes in the whole movie. I don't know. I cannot believe 
this scene because like we were saying, okay, this seems very extreme, but at the same time, if someone just faux kidnapped your daughter or actually kidnapped your child, like what would you do? Like, would you go attack them? Like, who knows? Like, we don't know because it's, it's, the unknown, like in, until it happens to you, you don't know how you'll react. You assume you know. And holy mother, like he almost kills her. She's gasping for air. She comes to and like he's like, okay, I can't do this. But wow. Yeah, he's going to. Ch- so the coolest thing to me about this scene was that it was about. Five minutes of them fighting, struggling, doing all this stuff. And from the second she cracks the door open and he barges in, nobody even says a word. Like, every emotion and message is sent through, like, facial expressions, you know, and, like, just physical acts. And it's just very, like, a very primal type scene, I guess you could say. Yeah, there is, there is absolutely no word spoken. And... What an amazing scene in a film. Yeah, and that, you know, he says he'll kill her and all that. And then when it all comes down to it, he doesn't. He could have, probably. And then she gets up, back up and attacks him with a knife. And then he wrestles the knife away. And they're kind of like just staring at each other. And he has the knife and he ends up walking out. But yeah, I mean, that was just a crazy scene the climax of this movie like i the only thing i knew about this entire movie i've never seen it was basically the bunny boiling scene and so the climax of this movie was intense beyond my expectation yeah i mean i figured it all kind of come down to like a big final showdown at you know it ended up happening at their house out in the suburbs um i can't remember how they just flash you open a drawer and you could see a gun so you kind of you know we both kind of looked at each other like yeah that's gonna come into play but typical like myself at least i'm like i already forgot about it five minutes later but yeah she her his wife's gonna take a bath and uh glenn close ends up attacking her in the bathroom as the bath is running and michael douglas is downstairs making he's making tea and the teapot is literally making the screaming sound and he can't hear his wife and it's finally he takes the teapot off the stove and then he hears his wife and the the water is like dripping through the ceiling because it's overflowing so he I think he suspects he's going to go up there, but then the tea starts making the noise and it's all very, you know, well-timed and uh, pretty good. This final battle, like he is drowning her in the bathtub, which his wife was running for her own self-help because she was in this car accident. He ends up putting Glenn close under the water, but guess what? As every villain in every horror movie, she's not dead. Yeah, they never die the first time, and usually not even the second time. But, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a great visual, too, because she's underwater, motionless, with her eyes just open. And she seems dead, but... um, And then, typical, and you know, end of movie thing, he lets his guard down. And he's just sitting by the bathtub, and then she just emerges from the bathtub with the knife and then all of a sudden like his his wife just shoots her right in the chest so there was that gun that came back into play and we were like oh my god we both forgot about that but yes so i love that the wife ended up being the hero in the end scenario and little ellen like i mean she's probably gonna be traumatized but I mean, it's going to be okay, right? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, yeah, Ellen was there for the whole thing. They never show Ellen, who I believe is sleeping. So hopefully. Yeah, and they just then they just end the movie basically um, 
zooming in on the a family portrait of them. So you have to wonder, you know, what happened after that. So when the end credits were rolling, I was just kind of looking at them to see the names. And it said, like halfway down the thing, it said uh, party guest or something. And it said Jonathan Brandis. So I don't know if he was the kid from Ladybug. So I don't know if he was actually in the movie or if that was a diff- different Jonathan Brandis. But I, that's kind of a coincidental name if it's not why don't you go look it up right now so we can clarify it for our listeners. So I'm looking up on some message board thing from 2018 and people are asking the same question. And some guy says, I've checked my final or my copy of Fatal Attraction. As far as I could see, there's no 11 year old boy at the party scene. The scene is very crowded. I can't tell for sure, but <laughs> it's just a bunch of adults and there's no children. So I don't think it's the same person. Oh, there's another Jonathan Brandis. Yeah, I believe uh, on IMDb there's only one movie credit for, for the other one, so that's too bad. Oh, sorry, other Jonathan Brandis, but guess what? If you're out there listening, like tweet us because we want to give you a shout out. So, and then one other thing I wanted to mention is about getting receiving prank calls or. Back in the day, getting calls. So we used to get either a prank call or a call where nobody was on the other end of the line. So my mom used to answer. (laughs) And she'd go, hello? 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 If you're not going to say anything, I'm just going to hang up. And then she'd hang up. (laughs) (laughs) I love it how there was this actual sequence because guess what? People prank called all the time back in the day. And if someone prank calls you and doesn't say anything, that's the exact like reaction they want. Right? Of course. I had a friend who she and her brother would like engage with prank callers and they would be like, I'm Michael Jackson. I'm our Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they would just like play along and have a long conversation. And their mother was always like, do not do this. And they're like, no, it's the best. But yeah, prank calling when someone will interact, that is the best. So yeah, we used to look up like numbers in the phone book and like ask for the person. So we had this, We I don't know, it's like my brother and I. We looked up one, and so we called it, and some older lady answered, and my brother's like, he's like, Grandma? And they're like, like Jason, is that you? And then we were like talking to him all the time, so that was pretty funny. Aw, maybe you made their day. Mark, that makes me sad. Yeah, I, th- I, I think we made their day, so. And we, all, we also got... um the old phone number of some somebody named Dwayne. So we used to always get these calls for Dwayne. And then if we eventually started saying, like, instead, instead of saying it was the wrong number, we'd be like, like, no, Dwayne's not here right now. Or once there was, like, a tornado, and they're like, is, like, is Dwayne there? And we're like, no. And they're like, oh, there's, there's a tornado in the area. We're like, oh, no, we can't find him. We can't find him. No, <laughs> you're the worst. That's the worst. <laughs> no. It was just for fun. It was, they knew we were joking, I think. No, they didn't, Mark. Like, they literally believed Wayne is dead till this day. I feel. I do feel bad. And then one more quick prank call story. My sister's friend, we were just, like, bored on, like, I don't know, some day you're off of school. And we were making prank calls, and my sister's friend dialed my friend's number, and my friend's mom answered it, and I said something bad to her, because I didn't know it was her. And then she goes, Mark Florence, is that you? And I hung up. Oh, no. Let's rank this movie on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being you hated it, 10 being you think it's a perfect movie. Our scale obviously has to be boiled rabbits. I know I hate it, but, like, that's the scale, right? Yeah, it has to be. That's the lasting image from the movie, I think. 
How many boiled rabbits do you give Fatal Attraction? I'm going to go with um, eight and a half boiled rabbits. I really kind of got into the movie, felt the suspense, you know, was always worried about what was going to happen next. You know, I thought all that, you know, actors, actresses, everyone involved did well. And as I, as like halfway through the movie, I was like, Kelly did this, was this up for awards? And it was up for numerous awards, including best picture. So yeah, I thought it was just really good. Um, I guess there's really not much about it. I didn't like, I'm also giving it, well, I'm giving it an eight. I think you went eight and a half. I'm giving it an eight solid like I don't know why I haven't seen this movie I guess because when it came out it was sort of like no no like this is not a your age picture because I was 10 when it came out like that yeah that's not appropriate for a 10 year old but solid plot solid acting creepy AF and overall good job yeah, that's a good point. It's not really like a movie you would watch when you're younger or even like in your 20s probably. So that's probably why we all missed it. Like it's not like some movie like, yeah, I watched it when I stayed home from school or something. So yeah, it's it wasn't really in the target market for us, I guess. Yeah, like some hor- like traditional quote-unquote horror movies or thrillers. It was more about like, oh, guess what? You're an adult and you have these responsibilities and you have a child and you fucked up. So what are you going to do about it? Exactly. Yeah. Good synopsis. Yeah. That was good. (laughs) You didn't even need to watch it now, listeners. Okay. (laughs) Like I summed it up. So until next time, we'll see you in the horror section. Bye.